beginning in Second Peter, the uh, first chapter, verse one. Sign, summon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness for the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, in your moral excellence knowledge, and in your knowledge self-control, and your self-control perseverance, and your perseverance, godliness, and your godliness, brotherly kindness, and your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, have forgotten his purification, purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren, be, of all, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied unto you. As we look at the, the book of Second uh, Peter, it's the second of two letters that uh, Peter wrote to the group here based on the third chapter in verse one. He mentions he had sent a previous letter to them. Based on the third chapter, verse 15 and 16, the apostle Paul has also written a letter that, that these people had access to or, or had. So I, th I think from these things, they have been Christians for some time. And, and so, and now they are being confronted as we're going to, as we would see in chapter two and three, they're going to be confronted in their Christianity with false teaching. So Peter seems to write this letter to stabilize them in Christ so that uh, the false teaching will, uh, will, will not draw them away. In this first part of the, the book in chapter one, I think we see Peter's approach to how he's going to, to deal with the false teaching. His approach is at first, as we see in these, these first 11 verses, he sets before them how to be Christians or what being a Christian is about. And, if, and I think that's very interesting. We don't have to know all the false doctrine in the world if we know the truth. That's going to be one of the principles I think we can see from this section. Peter presents to them how they should be living and how they should uh, set a goal for their life. A, as you can see on the, on the board here, I think one of the most significant phrases in the whole text is that we can be partakers of the divine nature. Now, I don't know about you, but that is a concept that is so far above me that I grasp even think that I could be a partaker or one who in some way acts like God or partakes of God's very nature himself. But as we see in this text, that is a going to be a goal that Peter sets before each one of us, that we become partakers of the divine nature. And so what I want to do is go through this text and see how Peter explains that and how he gives us an avenue to get there. And I think that is, is one of the great things about this text. Peter not only sets this lofty goal for us, he tells us how we can reach that lofty goal uh, in, in our lives. So we'll begin here with the, uh, the, the first verse. It says, Peter, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. I want us to... A couple of things I want to just think about in that that phrase there. Those who have received a faith of the same kind as ours. These people he's writing to, he considers their faith to be the same as the apostles' faith. I think the ours are probably 
ref, refers to the apostles. Paul and Peter had written to them. And we all recognize the apostles had a strong faith. This group of people he's writing to have a faith that is the same. I, uh, it's the same kind, I think, in two ways. One, its origin is the same. It comes from the God's teaching. And the second is it comes from within people who accept and believe in that teaching. And so that's going to have the same results. The second thing I, I see in this phrase here, I've got underlined, is they have received. Anytime we receive something or a gift or something, it's, it's from they have received this, as we're going to see in the last line of this verse here, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. They did not get this faith or receive this faith from something that was great on their behalf, on, on, from within them or on their part. They have received it by the righteousness of God. And so it is by grace that they have this faith. It is God's grace that has given it to the, the message to them and given them the opportunity to have faith within themselves. Uh, and so I, I think from the outset, Peter is, is showing that they are united with the apostles in the in that they have the same faith. And also it is something that is they have by the grace of God. Now just think about us for a few moments. We can also be united in that way with the apostles and these people. Our faith is the thing that we're going to see through this reading and we see through the whole New Testament is the key element in our connection with God and the apostles. Them having the same faith as the apostles was a key element in them being connected with the apostles and with God. And so from the outset, we're going to see that 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 faith is a key element for them. Another thing in verse two here, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you. Because they have a faith in Jesus, I have the word blessing out there in parentheses at the end of that first line. That is a blessing that is a result of their faith. Grace and peace uh, uh, exist or is multiplied unto them. Grace and peace is a phrase that if you read through Paul's epistles and, and the other epistles of the New Testament, that is a blessing that is in the introductory part of almost every single epistle of the New Testament. And we begin to understand that by the grace of God, we can have peace. And I want us to look at uh, Romans, the first chapter, and uh, or Romans, the fifth chapter in verse one, Paul states this so well, and he the, these two words of, of grace and peace. He says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we also have obtained our introduction by faith into his grace in which we stand and we celebrate in hope of the glory of God. Grace and peace are products or results of, re of true faith. They're the blessings of true faith. And so when we have true faith in Jesus and we submit ourselves to him in baptism, we immediately get the grace, we experience the grace of God, and we have peace with God. I want us to go back and look at this, this line here, but Peter in his writing here, he talks about grace and peace be multiplied. And I think that's going to be one of the ideas that I want us to uh, focus on as we go forward in, in this reading, in this part of the chapter here. They already have grace and peace that was a result of their faith that, uh, that they had in Jesus and submitted to him. They are justified uh, before God because of that. But Peter is suggesting that they can multiply layer upon layer of blessing to themselves uh, in Christ. And that's what it seems to be he is suggesting here that he's wanting for them is this layer of layer blessing. And that's one of the things I, uh, what I want us to take from today's lesson is that we can have layer and layer 
of grace and peace multiplied upon us if we will follow the instruction of the of the Holy Spirit and Peter in this passage. He says in the second line there, he says, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the avenue to grace and peace is the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Uh, the knowledge here is, is expressed in this passage. The knowledge is going to be a word we're going to see be, be reoccurring through these 11 verses uh, of Peter. Knowledge is not trivial knowledge, like we know all of the scores to the ball games and all the stats to the World Series. That's trivial knowledge. The knowledge that here he's talked of is the knowledge of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, it is the truth that exists because of God and Jesus Christ but it's also understanding that knowledge and the wisdom of that knowledge and that having an effect upon us, springing up within us to produce action on our parts. So grace and peace will be multiplied with you in or through understanding of who God is and how that relates to us as, as people. And so from the outset, we're, I think we can see that the blessings of God will be multiplied upon us as we begin to understand who God is. Now, in verse 3, he says, Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. That's a pretty broad statement, wouldn't you say? That he has granted everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, obviously here, he's not talking about physical life and sicknesses and diseases and, and computers and things like that. Those are physical things. He's, he's saying that he has revealed to us everything that per pertains to our, our spiritual life, our relationship with him, and our relationship with each other, and how we can live in this life in a godly fashion. I think this is also pointing ahead to chapter 2. In chapter 2, he's going to begin to deal with false teachers. The only reason that we would accept a new idea from a false teacher is because we might think God has left something out. Well, Peter's making the statement here that God hadn't left anything out. He's giving us everything we need to live with each other and to live with him as we should live. And again, let's go back to the, the second line in this verse, verse three, through the true knowledge of him who called you by his own glory and excellence. So where, where, just like he said in verse two, it's through the knowledge of God that we have the blessing of grace and peace. In this line, we can, we can, this, his divine power has granted us everything through the true knowledge, that's the understanding of who he really is. And I, if you look at the uh, Christ when he was on the earth, and particularly in the book of John, as he had conversations with the Pharisees on numerous occasions, look at how many times he says, this is the truth or this is true knowledge. Truth means that which is real. And so Jesus or uh, Peter is saying, that which is real about Christ, God has revealed that which is real about Christ, and uh, and through that's how we're going to be able to uh, uh, know everything about life and godliness is through this true knowledge of Jesus, which He called us by His own glory and excellence. Who is God? He is the glorious one, and He is the excellent one. I have parentheses beside this. Some translations use uh, virtue for the word excellence there. The idea seems to be in this place is that virtue is one who has goodwill or does that which is good, such as a virtuous woman of the, the book of Proverbs. She's always a going about doing good for others. And virtuous, and, and sometimes it's called translated moral excellence. We'll see that later here in the verse. It's that that which is morally the high ground as compared with morally the low ground, which the world lives in. And so God is always 
virtuous. He is on morally on the high ground, wanting to do that which is good. He is glorious, which symbolizes his greatness, but he is also good in what he does. And because of his greatness and goodness, he is able to reveal to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. That's his motivation, is his greatness and goodness to give every, everything we need to know how to live as people, have relationships with each other, and have a relationship with him. So Peter, in the outset, he's affirming this is how we can be what God would have us to be. We're not going to need this additional teaching, these false teachers. Going down to verse 4, for by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Uh, but by these, by his goodness and his glory, the attributes of God, he has made or granted to us, he has gifted us, his grace has gifted us precious and magnificent promises. And so you, you think about that as he has, because he is good, he wants good for us, because he is glorious and capable, he has made us magnificent promises uh, about what we can be and what we can do, so that by them, that by these promises that he's made, you may become partakers of the divine nature. Now, I, to me, that passage, the, the, the concept that I can become a partaker of, of God's nature is it's so marvelous and it's so far above what I can reach it's hard to believe, me to believe that it is really there and I don't know how you feel about that and sometimes I believe we as Christians we don't look to God enough or we don't reach for him enough because we think he's too far away from us to be able to attain those things we know that he was perfect he is in his goodness and in his graciousness. But he, Peter is saying here that he has made us promises so that we may attain to his nature. And I think that's a goal for us. It's what we need to, uh, as Christians, we need to be looking to attain to his nature and his goodness. I have three passages I want us to consider in addition to the passage here in 1 Peter. Or in Second Peter, which continue this idea of God's us mirroring God or being like God. In Hebrews 12, verse 10, but he disciplines us for our good so we may share his holiness. Sharing God's holiness is one of those lofty ideas that is far above me as a man or as a human, but he's saying you can share in this holiness. He corrects me and disciplines me to, to get me there. In Colossians 3 and verse 10, he says, put on the new self, which is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created it. We're to be, be and as Christians, we're be to, being made into his image of God. Again, sharing divine nature. And then in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, he says, but we all with unveiled faces looking as in a mirror at the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as from the Lord, the spirit. So as we go look in a mirror and we're going to be as looking plainly and clearly as we can at Jesus, we're going to see his glory and we're going to transform ourselves into that glory. So again, the, the, the New Testament is prevalent with the idea that we can attain to the glory of God, not that we will ever, that we can work toward the glory of God. Our goal is to work toward the glory of God. And we can have the divine nature in this life, in our living, and that should be our goal. Um, now let's go to, go to verse four. And he, he says in, in verse four says, for, for th uh, th through these or by these, he has granted us his, for, for by these or through these, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. 
And then in, in the last part of that verse, I want us to focus on now, having escaped the corruption is in this world by lust. There's a great contrast for us. We're going to become partakers of the divine nature and we're going to escape the, uh, uh, the corruption that's in the world. That's what we began when we became Christians. The reason we came to Christ through faith and submitted ourselves to him is because we were carrying a baggage of corruption in our sins and consequences of sin that we had accumulated because we had been drawn by the lusts of the world. And so he is saying, we've escaped that. Now let's move forward to become partakers of the divine nature knowing that is behind us. Now we're going to go to verse five and six, or five through seven. In this section, Peter actually gives us a path to travel to accomplish this great task. And I think that is, to me, that is, uh, is significant for us because that is such a, a mighty task, a mighty goal to be possessing the divine uh, uh divine nature, divine character. He says, for now, now for this reason, this very reason, applying all diligence, the first thought Peter's going to share with us, it's not going to happen easily or without effort. I don't know if you've noticed if you try to accomplish something new or something different for yourself, the first few tries at that are not, don't look very promising most of the time. Now, there are several of you that are trying to uh, uh, learn to speak some Spanish. And I'll, I'll challenge you to carry on a conversation with Angel in Spanish right now. So I said most of you would have a, have a difficult time doing that, carrying on, because you're trying to learn to do something new. But as you strive and work on that, I'm sure the conversation will get, become more fluid and better. But it's going to take diligent work to get there. The same thing, if we're going to be people that have the nature or the character of God, it's going to take work for us to get there. We did not get that immediately. We got immediately the forgiveness of our sins and justification with our baptism into Christ. But we did not get that all of those characteristics immediately when we were baptized. And so I think what Paul or Peter is saying here. He's giving them a track or a path where they can add these things. And when they begin to add these things, layers of blessings are going to come upon them of grace and peace that they which are far beyond or exceed what they had in, in the beginning. So now it's going to take diligence or some effort. He says, in your faith, supply more elections. I want to see he starts with faith. He started in verse one of, of this. They were they have received a faith which is the same as what the apostles received. Every one of us begins in Jesus Christ with faith. It's based on our trusting what he has said and our submitting to him in faith. And what Peter is saying is next, I want you to add moral excellence or virtue. Virtue was that quality of goodness of God that caused him to respond to us in the first place. Remember, we saw that a couple of verses back. His goodness, his desire for our good caused him to respond to us. So our first ch challenge as individuals is that we believe in Christ now. We believe that what God has, has presented to us is to want good for ourselves and for others. Moral unexcellence, we might say, or, or moral debauchery uh, would be what we have been in when we were in our sins. We, that was, we were captive to the corruption of the world. We've come out of that now, and we're going to be want to look up with wanting goodness for others. Now, I think it's interesting that that seems to be the very first step we need to take as individuals when we become Christians is quit looking at the old things we saw and start looking at the good things that we have through God and we can share with each other. So our first step 
is morally looking for the good, the virtuous uh, qualities of life. The second thing he says in your moral life, once you begin to look at the good that you can do and have for others, you need to look at knowledge. Again, this is the third time the word knowledge is shown up in this text. Knowledge is the way that we understand who God is and what he wants for us. We can want to do the good for each other all day long, but until we understand what God considers good, we won't know what good is. So this is the next logical step. We have to know what good is, and we gain that knowledge from the Lord Jesus Christ. That's understanding uh, what that is. Then after we understand or know what is good, he says we have to have self-control. Self-control is restraining ourselves within the boundary of that which is good. Sometimes, you know, when we're growing up as individuals, our parents may get, talk and teach us about things that are good or things that we should be doing. And it's always a temptation to run outside of those things and do things that come to our mind or come to others' mind that we might consider to be more exciting or, or something we'd rather do. Well, what Peter says here, once we know what is good, then we need to confine ourselves within the limits of what is good and not be running off into other places. Again, this is going to apply to these false teachers. A new doctrine comes in. If it's not within what has been defined as good, then it must be controlled not to run after that is what he's suggesting here. The next step in his, his path to uh, uh, the divine nature is to, the, once you have control of, of, of staying within what is good, persevere. Don't just do it in one situation, do it in all situations of our lives. And I don't know if you have noticed or not, but I have noticed in my life, I can really get good at persevering or, or, or controlling myself in one area Another area just runs rampant. I don't know if you've noticed that or not. But he says, persevere in every area of your life. As you learn that which is good, persevere to applying this self-control in all areas of your life. That way you will be consistent. You won't be going in all directions. And then in your perseverance, develop godliness. Now, when I first read that, I thought, well, that's god likeness, but that's only God-likeness in a sense. Godliness is having a reverence and respect for who God is. So whenever I am persevering in, in self-control, I can either get grumpy or feel like I am being punished, or I can recognize that God is leading me for my good. I can have a kind regard reverence for God, and then that I will, will understand my need to persevere and to continue in that. And so it's, the, all of these things are progressive, and each one adds and builds to the next. After I per per persevere in that and see this is the nature of God, then I, I will, then I add to that brotherly kindness. So this is, brotherly kindness here is a Philadelphia type love based on the, uh, uh, the, the text there. And as I begin to share kindness, good, with those I am in bond with, I'm in fellowship with. And then finally, he says, and then to your brotherly kindness add love, which is the agape love, which is the love that God has for us. We begin to extend that to all mankind, all people. So, when we've done that, we've actually become partakers of the divine nature because what is God defined as? God is love. We have that song. And when we arrive at the agape love that, that, that Christ is, then we become a partaker in some way of the divine nature. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that we're going to run through this cycle lickety split one time and we're going to be perfect examples of God. I'm going to suggest to you that it's going to take, it's a cycle. 
And as we go through the cycle, we're going to keep building each one of these qualities as we go through. Other thing I want us to notice as we we'll put all these up here, how many of these are real activities? Well, none of them are really activities unless you would consider knowledge as study is an activity. The rest of these, act, uh, these things listed here are characteristics. So we've got to work on our characteristics of people develop the characteristics of God. That is what he's trying to get us to say. We can participate in the nature of God. We can have the nature of God when we get our characteristics of life to match the characteristics of God. And that, that's our goal with this, is to, to develop the characteristics of God. And this verse uh, 8 here also suggests that this is a cycle. He says, for if these qualities, again, these qualities or characteristics are in us, are yours and are increasing. So this week, I'm going to grow a little on these. Next week, a little more on these. And so I am going to incrementally work toward the true character of God with my life. But I think it's important for us to see that it's a, a, something that's a process it's something we have to apply to ourselves, something we have to think about, something we have to plan, and we have to see the end goal and work toward that, that uh, end goal. Now, he says, for if these qualities are in you and increasing, look at this promise from God. They render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's kind of a negative way of stating a positive, right? It means... We've got this true knowledge again. This is the fourth time, I think, that it's, this idea has shown up in our reading here. It's truly what Jesus Christ and God look like. You're not going to be unfruitful in developing that in your life if you develop these characteristics, is what, what Peter is saying here. If you And then he goes on to the next part of the, the, the verse here in verse 9. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, have forgotten his purification from his former sins. If we don't develop these qualities, we've forgotten who we are. We've forgotten that we came in faith to Jesus Christ, confessed him as our Lord, and were baptized in him because we wanted to get rid of that load of sins that was behind us the unfruitful deeds of darkness, the unfruitful deeds of this world that we were trying to get rid of. We have forgotten our very purpose in coming to Jesus if we do not develop these characteristics in our life. Now, I think that's a challenge. I don't know about you, but I think Peter is challenging these people and he's challenging us. We can't just get dipped into Christ, and then go sit down. Yes, we get the blessing of, of his, his grace and forgiveness, grace and peace, what comes with being baptized, but this layer on layer of grace and peace, blessings that come from God, do not come if we just get dipped and sit down. And that, I think that's what Peter is saying here. Plus, in their situation, when the false teachers come, they're going to be led away because they're not grounded in the truth. Therefore, Peter's charge. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. How we make certain is we go ahead and apply this teaching to ourselves. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied unto you. What greater promise could we have? But Peter says we've got to develop our characteristics. We've got to develop our attitudes so we're growing toward the Lord because if we're not growing toward the Lord, we're going to fall back in to what we left.
And that's the challenge for us here. And so I want to just uh, leave that message with you this morning. I want to challenge myself and each one of you this week to read through this passage, look at particularly in verses five through seven and measure in our lives for ourselves how we are building on those characteristics or those qualities in our character to become more in the image of God. This morning, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you can, you can become a Christian, a servant of God, based on your faith in Jesus Christ. Remember how many times we read through these, these verses this morning? What was the thing that they had, the same as the apostles had? They had a faith in Jesus Christ of the same kind as the apostles. That faith had caused them to submit themselves in baptism to Jesus Christ. All of that is because of the grace and the love of God, because of his goodness, wanting good for us to extend a blessing to us. He's made available to us an opportunity to start our life to serve him. So if you'd like to become a Christian this morning, or you have sins you'd like to have the congregation to pray about, we invite you as we stand and sing. Thank you.